Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for our In Your Reach providing services to survivors in rural detention facilities. My name is Vivian Hohola, Senior Program Director at JDI and I'll be your moderator today. JDI is a health and human rights organization that works to end sexual violence in all forms of detention. We have three core goals to hold government officials and agencies accountable for sexual abuse in their facilities, to change public attitudes about sexual violence behind bars, and to ensure survivors of prisoner rape get the help that they need. It's our fundamental belief that when the government takes away someone's freedom, it takes on an absolute responsibility to protect that person's safety. No matter what crime someone's committed, rape is not part of the penalty. We know that sexual abuse in abuse is not an inevitable part of prison life. Prisons and jails with committed leaders, good policies and sound practices can keep inmates safe. We'd like to take a moment to, take, to thank the Office on Violence Against Women for its generous support of this webinar and for our larger project called No Bad Victims, Support for Incarcerated Survivors. Just a few things before we get started. I want to remind you, some of what we're going to be discussing today may be difficult to hear or upsetting. Please take time to take care of yourselves. This webinar will be recorded so you'll have an opportunity to revisit it later if necessary. You can submit questions and comments throughout the webinar using the questions box on the right side of your screen. The webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website in the next few days. We'll send more information later today, including a link to an evaluation, and the recording will also be closed captioned. We have a wide range of other resources available on our website. We'll review those in more detail at the end of today's webinar. The aim of this webinar is to help community-based rape crisis organizations and other service providers in rural communities develop or strengthen their capacity to provide services to incarcerated survivors. We'll begin with some background information about rural communities and corrections facilities. We'll discuss what JDI has learned on our projects working with facilities in rural communities. We'll chat with Becca Corby from Healthy Families of Clallam County, Washington about her experience as an advocate and a director of a multi-service community organization that serves incarcerated survivors. And finally, we'll end with plenty of time for uh, your questions at the end. A quick note on some terms before moving on. While law enforcement and prosecutors and victims' rights groups tend to use the term victim in recognition of the crime that was committed, JDI prefers to use the term survivor. And we do this to honor the strength and resiliency it takes to live through a sexual assault and for that person to heal. The terms inmate and prisoner will be used interchangeably to refer to incarcerated people. If you have questions about a specific term, please use the question box and a JDI staff member will assist you. We're going to start with a survivor story. This is Policarpio. He was sexually abused several times in the Kern Valley State Prison. I'd like to invite my colleague, Carolina Aparicio, to read you the testimony he shared with JDI. So this is an excerpt. Carolina. Thank you. Um, this is an excerpt from um, Policarpio's testimony. I was at the Kern Valley State Prison facility. I was standing in front of the toilet using the restroom when an MTA, or a medical technical assistant, passed by my cell door. He quickly came back and looked down at my penis. I turned in an attempt to cover myself. The MTA then left. After the MTA left, my cellie told me, Hey fool, I think that MTA likes you. I just told him, Man, I ain't no fag. The, the next time we went out to the yard, the shot caller, a powerful inmate who controls part of the facility and other inmates, wanted to talk to me and basically wanted me to seduce the MTA so he could bring in drugs. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I was afraid and scared of what I was being asked to do but even more afraid of what would happen to me if I failed to do what I was being asked. I told the shot caller I would take care of it. That same day, the MTA came to my cell door and asked if I smoked. I told him yes. The next day, the MTA brought me a pack of red Marlboros and a Bic lighter. He then reached inside my food port and tried to grab my penis. I quickly pulled away from the door and told the MTA, No man, what are you doing? He just said, Come on now, honey, ain't nothing for free. 
The next time we went out for yard, the shot caller was waiting to talk to me. My celly had told me that I didn't allow myself had told him that I didn't allow myself to be touched. It was obvious that the shot caller was mad. He then asked what was going on, why wasn't I sticking to the plan? He began to threaten me by sending me on a mission to stab someone. The same day, the MTA came to my cell door, opened the food port, and handed me a pouch of tobacco. He then reached inside my cell and grabbed my penis and began to fondle me. I couldn't take it. I pulled away feeling violated, ashamed, humiliated, but most of all scared. This happened each time he came to the building I was housed in to pass out med medication. He would bring tobacco and sexually assault me every time. On one occasion, he even performed oral sex on me. He brought in drugs for the shot caller one time. The assault happened for almost three months. Then he, then he was transferred to another institution. As time went by, I began to feel worse, with more nightmares and anxiety attacks. I felt so disgusted with myself, ashamed. Things got really bad for me. I couldn't continue living. I wanted to die. I found myself naked in a suicide room. Finally, I was able to tell someone what happened to me. At first, no one wanted to hear about it. As soon as they heard the word sexual assault by staff, the conversation ended there. I started to think that maybe I should have never said anything. When I first told the staff of what happened, it seemed like I was reliving the whole thing because I had to retell the story over and over. At this point, my mental health deteriorated. I had to be placed on suicide watch twice. Ever since then, I've slowly made a good recovery. I attended and finished a PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder class. I'm currently receiving mental health treatment and group therapy. I've come a long way and I want to become a survivor. Prison rape and sexual assaults happen very often in here. No one knows about it because it goes unreported. Victims are not only afraid to complain because of the consequences of being labeled a snitch, but also because of the shame, humiliation, and embarrassment of being sexually assaulted by another man, not to mention the lack of cooperation one gets from staff. I, enc I encourage others who have been abused to come forward with their complaint, not only to see justice, but to begin to heal. You cannot live with it inside all your life, because sooner or later it will destroy your whole life. Talking about it is the first step to recovery. Thank you, Carolina, for sharing Policarpio's story. What Policarpio didn't mention in his story is that it took a long time for him to get adequate mental health care. He was told by the prison administration that they didn't provide treatment for victims of sexual assault with PTSD. As far as we know, he was never able to meet with an advocate or a mental health care provider for his PTSD, even after filing a lawsuit against the facility. It's good to know that he's doing better now, though think about what a difference it might have made if he would have had access to help sooner. Before we go any further, I'd like to get an idea of who we have in the audience today. So please tell us where your agency is located. You can submit your city and town and state by typing into the question box. And we'll give a couple of moments for folks to do that. So it looks like we have people from Olympia, Washington, and Corpus Christi, Christi Texas. Sorry about that. Uh, Lake Isabella, California, Beaver Dam, Wisconsin, Prince Frederick, Maryland, Richmond, Virginia, Los Angeles, New Mexico. Great, it looks like we have almost every region of the country represented. Please feel free to ask questions and make comments during the webinar by typing them into the question box. We hope many of your questions will be answered throughout the webinar, and we'll be answering those that may not have been addressed during the question period. If we don't get to something, feel free to reach out to us afterwards by email at advocate at justdetention.org. I'm going to begin today's webinar with some context. Uh, the United States is the world's leader in incarceration, with 2.4 million people currently in the nation's prisons or jails. That's approximately one in every 100 adults. And this is a 500% increase over the past 30 years. And you can see from the graph how it breaks down between 
prisons and jails and um, federal prisons, immigration and juvenile detention. Um, the tremendous increase in incarceration in the U.S. doesn't mean that we've become substantially more criminal or violent over this time. The explanation has more to do with politics and policy. Since the 70s, Congress and state legislatures have enacted a number of changes to laws that have required prison time for lesser offenses and ensured longer sentences for violent crimes and repeat offenders. The war on drugs has also ensured that drug crimes, even simple possession, received more attention from the police and harsher, harsher punishment in the courtrooms. In the 80s, there were mandatory minimum laws for drug crimes and violent offenses. The 90s brought us three strike laws. More than half of the states uh, give a third offense mandatory sentences of 25 years or more. Truth in sentencing laws also required offenders to serve at least 85% of their sentences. So over the past three decades, correctional facilities have also become our de facto mental health institutions. In fact, the largest mental health facilities in our country right now are jails. And they're Rikers Island in New York, Cook County Jail in Chicago, and Los Angeles County Jail here in my neighborhood. As you can see from the graph, the increase in prisoners from 1970 on was much more significant in state prisons and local jails. And the U.S. has the highest incarceration rate in the world. This isn't because we have higher crime rates, but because we imprison more types of criminal offenders, including nonviolent and drug offenders, and the mentally ill, and we keep them in prison longer. So what exactly does this expanding U.S. prison population mean for your rural communities? Well, since 1980, most new prisons built to accommodate the increase have been placed in non-metropolitan areas. Prior to 1980, only about 36% 30 of prisons were located in rural communities and in small towns. In the 60s and 70s, the average, um, there was an average of four new prisons built in rural um, areas every year. During the 80s, it grew to about 16 a year. In the 90s, it jumped to 25 new prisons a year. And between 1990 and 1999, 245 prisons were built in rural and small communities, with a prison opening somewhere in rural America every 15 days. While most of this growth has slowed and it even reversed in some areas, what it means is the majority of prisoners are now housed in rural communities and in your service areas. Now, many of you have heard the numbers of uh, prevalence in previous webinars, but they bear repeating. A Bureau of Justice Statistics report released in 2012 surveyed former state prisoners about their most recent incarcerations, which, have included a which would have imp included a prison, jail, community correction setting. It found that about one in 10 inmates have been sexually abused behind bars. Another BGS survey found that anywhere from about 4.4% of prison inmates and 3.1% of jail inmates report sexual victimization in the previous 12 months of their incarceration. This doesn't seem like a really large number by percentage, but when we're talking about over 2.4 million people incarcerated, that percentage adds up to 600 people a year or 25 people an hour. During this webinar, this 90 minutes we're going to spend together, 37 people would have been abused. Know that the numbers are individuals and not incidents. What we know is that most survivors are abused multiple times and, and sometimes even by multiple perpetrators. The numbers also don't include immigration detention or community corrections. So we know that we're talking about more than 200,000 people per year that are abused in corrections facilities. And we know that a large number of these survivors will be in facilities in your communities and service areas. So let's talk about what your agencies are doing and can do to provide services to these survivors. But uh, let's take a quick poll first. As a service provider in a rural area, what's your agency's biggest challenge in providing services to incarcerated survivors? And we'll give you about 30 seconds to collect some responses.
Okay, it looks like with. Okay, here we go. <laughs> so it looks like um, the majority of you have gotten a chance to vote. And what we're looking at is a few staff members that, that the out weighing concern right here is really capacity and the number of um, staff at your agency and also distances that you need to travel. That's, we hear that quite a lot. If there's a, a major concern that wasn't one of these four, please go ahead and you can type that into the question box and we can, um, we can actually make sure we address that during the question portion as well. So now I'd like to introduce Linda McFarlane. JDI's Deputy Executive Director to the webinar. She's going to be talking about some of the things that we've learned working with corrections facilities in rural communities. Welcome, Linda. Thanks. Thanks so much, Vivian. Um, as Vivian mentioned, I'm going to talk about some of the different projects that JDI has worked on with corrections facilities in rural communities. And just to note that these projects generally included a pretty broad range of work from working on their policies, working on response protocols, staff training, inmate education. Um, but our, our projects always have an aspect of attempting to increase services for survivors who are incarcerated. So I'm going to focus on that. I'm going to focus on our, our joint work with um, partners at rape crisis centers in the rural communities. So I'm going to start with Lincoln County, which is um, a, a large rural county about 90 minutes away from Denver. The jail is located in Hugo, a small town in that county. Um, as I said, it's about 90 minutes away from Denver, but that's in the summer. It's a lot further in the winter. And I mentioned the proximity to, Den to Denver because Lincoln County is officially within the service area of the Denver Rape Crisis Program um, called the Blue Bench. And like many rural service areas, the advocates who are specifically in that community are systems advocates. And what I mean by that is they work with the district attorney, um, the victim's assistance office, or under the sheriff's department, or a hospital, as opposed to at a private rape crisis program. And because of that, they don't have the same confidentiality, they don't have the same privileged communication, and so they're often only really able to provide services to survivors who've either already reported and have an ongoing case or would like to report or are willing to report. Um, and again, that's because of the legal or medical systems rules regarding confidentiality. So I bring up this exam case example because it really, I think, is a case where we saw that persistence creativity and buy-in about the needs for services for survivors that are commensurate with the community standard was, was really needed from all partners. And, and again, we saw just in our poll that well over half of you have a concern that there's few staff members at our agency. So one of the themes that I saw it, throughout these projects, and certainly here in Lincoln County, was the sharing of resources, the pulling together of different places and different people in the community to find creative, um, creative solutions to that very problem. So over a couple of years, really, the Lincoln County Jail, the Sheriff's Office Victim Advocate, Just Detention International, and the Blue Bench and other community members worked together to kind of piece together a solution for advocacy services for survivors in Lincoln County. And the result was a real team or a patchwork quilt approach. And so what we ended up with was confidential hotline services are available through the Blue Bench. Um, a local victim advocate who um, is a therapist and a social worker, provides services to any survivor who's reported or would like to report. Um, sorry, that victim advocate out of the sheriff's office. Um, the sheriff's office then contracts with a local social worker who received training from the Blue Bench. So again, their approach was hotline calls from the Blue Bench, the Rape Crisis Center in Denver, um, the sheriff's victim advocate to providing legal advocacy essentially, and then a contract social worker who be then became an advocate through the Blue Bench to provide follow-up services or services to people who don't want to report. Um, I'm going to move to Kern County, and I heard there was someone I think from Kern County on the phone here, and um, it's a vast, spread out, high desert community. 
Kern County as a whole contains a fairly large city, several towns, some very small villages, um, and large areas that are very sparsely or not at all populated. And one of the challenges here is, of course, the distances that advocates must travel to serve everyone in the county are really daunting. Um, they also, like many rural counties, have a lot of corrections facilities in their air service area. Probably it's at least half a dozen. Also, like many service providers, Women's Center High Desert provides many services for the community and really provides most of the social services that women and survivors receive of any kind. And so JDI and Women's Center High Desert have actually worked together for many years, um, beginning with Women's Center High Desert providing services in a large men's prison that's in their service area. And now, more recently, Women's Center High Desert provides a full array of services to survivors in the county jail. And I want to say that the primary lesson learned here in Kern County was about really about sharing resources. So Women's Center High Desert had a willingness, and many of the staff did, to provide the services to incarcerated survivors from the beginning. But they needed training for their staff. And at first, they needed some supervision for counselors who were seeing incarcerated survivors because there wasn't anybody at the agency that had that experience. So we worked together to where JDI would provide training for staff and some supervision, and they would provide the direct services. Then also, another exchange was with the prison. Women's Center High Desert provided services for the prison, and then staff at the prison helped Women's Center High Desert with a fundraiser and then with a holiday campaign that was very important to Women's Center High Desert. Women's Center High Desert also mobilized some resources they had in the community to get some basic equipment that the prison needed in order to do good evidence collection at the prison. Women's Center High Isle Desert also works with partners with another rape crisis program in the area, and they worked out a system of sharing some of the work so that if an advocate from Women's Center High Desert wasn't available for a hospital accompaniment, for example, an advocate from the other agency, the Alliance is their name, um, would help the survivor at the hospital and then transfer services over. So when we began to work with Women's Center High Desert, in the jail, the county jail specifically, to provide services. Really, as a team, we called upon the goodwill that Women's Center High Desert already had in the community. And you're going to hear Becca talk about the importance of this a little bit later. So they were already known for their work. They had relationships with the Sheriff's Department. And those were really the cornerstone of getting the work in the jail started and done. Um, because the groundwork had already been done by Women's Center High Desert with building relationships, the jail leadership knew the value of their work and was committing and was more easily committed to making a program for survivors in the jail work. They knew them already, say for example, from working on the SART in their community and other programs. And so the benefit here is that that project has wrapped up, but the jail has since contracted with Women's Center High Desert to provide services including a hotline and in-person counseling because after time of working together, they saw the value of the services and saw that this was something that they really needed to continue to make their jail and their community safer. I'm going to jump to a couple of examples here where the Prison Rape Elimination Act and work by the corrections departments in the counties ended up benefiting survivors who are not incarcerated. So in a way, sort of the flip side of what we usually see or think about. So Barnwell County, South Carolina is an example of one community where this happened. By beginning to work on the Prius standards, the Sheriff's Department also helped the community. The PREA coordinator at the jail, working with Just Detention International, started a project to be in full compliance with the PREA standards. And when they began to work on getting services in line for survivors, the team learned that there was no sexual assault response team in the county. And this PREA coordinator particularly was really dedicated to being a role model for smaller jails in South Carolina and um, for other counties across the state. And so she convened a group of community stakeholders. And that group's work together to successfully improve services for survivors all overall, not just in the jail, but again, the entire community. 
And so they now have an operating sexual assault response team. And one of the ways they work this out is that the rape crisis program now coordinates the SART and they work with a forensic examiner from a neighboring county because they didn't have one in theirs. Trinity County is in Northern California and um, this is another county where the resources to have a fully operational SART had not existed before. So here the juvenile facility undertook to lead a project to bring both the youth facility and the county jail into compliance with the PREA standards. So there were services in this county, really kind of robust services, um, but again, not many people, and they weren't organized into a sexual assault response team. So under the auspices of this Prison Rape Elimination Act project team that started because the juvenile facility was working on this grant project, the county brought together all the relevant parties and they decided that the first order of business before even working on implementing the PREA standards in either the jail or the youth facility should be to create a county-wide SART protocol. And so for this, for this organization, the act of putting the intentions and the procedures down on paper, it was so important here to have these sorts of protocols worked out because of limited staffing um, and resources, and also the weather, which meant that traveling could be very hazardous in the winter, and so they needed to have several different protocols to handle different situations when people might not be available or when weather might mean they'd have to change where they were actually going to take someone for services. I think one characteristic of, of rural programs that I've worked with are is that people are used to pitching in and helping whenever needed and that was certainly too, true in Trinity County. Um, but again, the fact that there wasn't already a set protocol meant that steps were being missed. It also meant that from the perspective of the juvenile facility and the jail, meeting the PREA standards and proving that if they were to have an audit of their PREA standards implementation would be very difficult. So bringing these two needs together ended up benefiting everybody in the county. If I had to pick the three most important lessons from the examples I've gone through of survivor-centered programs that have been successful, I would say that there was sharing of resources and that meaning that in the end everybody has more. Um, persistence, especially about around building relationships, it pays off. You're going to hear Becca talk about that more later, but that it's not something that happens overnight. It's not one phone call. It's not one meeting. It's it's showing up. It's working together. It's getting to know and respect each other. And then also that the ability of providers in rural communities to think creatively and to use kind of whatever is at hand as a solution really often is the cornerstone of making a program for incarcerated survivors work. And so now I'm going to turn it back over to Vivian. Thank you, Linda. It was really helpful to hear how the agencies address these challenges that they faced and how these lessons might be used by others. So now we're going to be joined by Becca Corby. Becca is the Executive Director of Healthy Families in Port Angeles, Washington. The agency serves survivors of sexual assault, domestic violence, and child abuse and neglect. Becca's worked for Healthy Families for about 12 years and served as the executive director for the past seven. And Port Angeles is a, a small community at the far north of the Olympic Peninsula um, in Washington. It's actually closer to Victoria, British Columbia, and Canada than it is to Seattle. So Becca, thanks for joining us. Um, welcome. And could you tell us a little bit more about your community and your agency, Healthy Families? Absolutely. Hello. Thank you so much. Um, it's very nice to be here. Thank you for the nice introduction, Vivian. Hello, Linda and Carolina. You did a beautiful job. Hello, everybody else from around the country. Feel free to come visit us in Port Angeles anytime for those of you who are getting buried in snow or heat. Um, Healthy Families is a, a dual agency. We serve uh, victims of domestic and sexual abuse. We also serve victims of child abuse and neglect. And we just opened in the past few years the Children's Advocacy Center which uh, the philosophy of that focuses around the multidisciplinary team approach. And I just wanted to preface by saying that um, I know for many of you I will be saying things that you already know, so please bear with me. Um, Clarem County is the county that we reside in, and the population is about 72,000. 
my agency serves between 42 and 45,000 of those folks. And I have four full-time advocates, and I do probably 50% direct services in my time. So we are very busy and very small. Um, the, the picture of our county is an absolutely beautiful picture postcard. We are surrounded by mountains and water. It is pristine to look at. Uh, you peel away the veneer of this little community, and it is there's a very dark side. There are very few living wage jobs. Uh, there's a very high substance abuse issue here. The only thing I knew uh, coming from the Midwest and then the Southwest coming to this area that I knew about the area was the spotted owl and preservation of the spotted owl, which I would hear on National Geographic television back in the day. And so when I got here, and I was thinking maybe I'll see spotted owls, which I didn't, but what I did learn is that by through, throughout this aggressive preservation of this absolutely darling little bird, um, people working for generation after generation in the logging and fishing industries were displaced. And during the course of that time, um, were allowed through you know, multiple government programs to be re-educated. Primarily, we have one small community college, and primarily we're being re-educated into computer programming, which is a fabulous career, I'm sure. Um, but there are no jobs here. So it's a, a, a beautiful community with some very, very definitive challenges. As Vivian said, we're, we are very rural, very isolated, as I'm sure some of you are. Uh, the joke up here is you travel two hours before you start your trip. So that's that. Thank you. Thanks, Becca. What, what have been your particular challenges um, in serving incarcerated survivors there, or challenges that you, might, that you think might be unique to agencies in rural communities serving this population? Well, I think the first challenge was that, um, as I'm sure most of you have experienced, is hearing one of my least favorite phrases in the entire universe, which is, well, we've never done it that way. Or, I don't know why we would do that. Or the last one, which really is an activist and an advocate and a person pushing for social change, um, well, you know, these, these folks are getting what they deserve anyway. And so those... Becca, I'm, I'm sorry, let me interrupt you for just a second. We're, um, we're getting some comments that you're, uh, we're having difficulty hearing you. Okay, so you let me go try. Right into the mic. I am. Or headset. How's this? Sounds clear to me. Is that clear? Is that better for everyone? So if people can't yes, hear, just much let better. us know again. Much better. This is Carolina. One, two, three, you're, you're good to go. <laughs> for those of you who missed out, I said some extraordinarily wise things, so I'm really sorry. <laughs> OK. Um, where I was was some of the challenges, and I'll just backtrack a little bit, was um, hearing that one of my least favorite phrases, which is, well, we've never done it that way, and the, and, or why would we do it, or people who are incarcerated are getting what they deserve anyway. And walking into a community that is very rural, and um, in some branches of law enforcement, we're very set in their ways, and um, I'm going to be as polite as I can be, which is to say that change is very difficult for some people. So I think that once I was able to identify the community challenges, what I did was I looked into the agency first and said, what are the challenges we have to go out there and earn the trust of the community that we're working in? And it was a matter of looking at each and every program we offered, trimming the fat, cutting programs that were draining our agency, which is very small. We function on about 625000 a year. Um, and then improving the quality of, of advocacy through mentorship, through training, um, and also improving the quality of the programs. Um, and I found even that from the internal culture of the agency, I heard a lot, well, it's not the way we've done it before. Well, you're right, because now you're going to do it differently. So that was difficult. And that... I don't think is unique to rural communities. I do believe that unique to rural communities is the, the fact that there are far fewer resources available. 
So we have to be extremely cognizant of not duplicating services, making that local government funding dollar turn into a dollar and a half, being kind to each other, listening to each other, and not being afraid to um, uh, step into someone else's territory and say, look, we need to improve this. What can I do to improve my end of it? Thanks, Becca. Can you um, expand a little bit on how you've overcome some of these challenges and especially building the relationships? I know you work directly with um, the jail, your county jail there in Clallam County and also the juvenile detention center. Tell us a little more about those relationships. Absolutely. As someone who's not from this area, and for those of you who have you know, relocated into, into other areas, I think we've all experienced that we're not really considered um, you know, well entrenched in our community until we've lived here 20, 30, 40 years. And I'm not even close to that yet. So, and the other thing, the, the other advantage I had is I don't want any friends. I have two really good ones and that's plenty for me. And so I wasn't afraid to thoughtfully and with um, integrity and transparency, once I had done the work internally so that I could go out and say, look, this is, I know the way we did it, and my agency had a very well-earned, not so good reputation. Uh, quality of programs had really deteriorated. And I said, okay, so here's where we are today. Now tell me what service I can provide you. Um, I pulled, I recruited law enforcement. I'm very law enforcement heavy on my board. Uh, I've got a prosecuting attorney on my multi multidisciplinary team. I have a deputy attorney general on my board as well. And the, I depended on these folks to teach me how do I communicate with cops, lawyers, doctors. And I learned very early on that cops speak cop, lawyers speak lawyer, doctors speak doctor. And so what I did was, this was not about my ego, this was about the good of this community and providing holistic services to every single resident and visitor to this community, inclusive of those incarcerated. I didn't, I didn't even question that I would be serving people incarcerated. Now one of the big challenges was our funding for our sexual assault program uh, the funder does not allow serving within uh, facil jail facilities. Or rather, they will not fund it, I should say that. So I overcame that barrier by simply doing it anyway and finding money somewhere else. Um, but the most, absolutely the most important was building the relationships with law enforcement. And that was long, arduous. I'm not known for being patient, and I was really gifted with an opportunity to learn more patience. And the way that I approached law enforcement was, I don't know you, I don't know what you need, I don't know your job, you are the expert in that field, I'm the expert in domestic and sexual abuse. What can I do to make your job easier? And doors started opening, and the board members that I had nurtured relationships with were catalysts to uh, providing the entree into the really key players in all the branches of law enforcement. Well, Becca, that's great, um, and I've seen some of the really strong relationships you've built there. I know that the jail calls you if they have any questions at all about anything having to do with sexual assault, uh, sexual abuse of any kind. Um, what do you think are or may be the benefits of being a rural service provider uh, in serving these survivors? Well, I think the first benefit that always pops into my head, which may sound rather sick, is that because we're so way out in the boondocks, and if, for those of you who are old enough, I mean, this is a lot like Mayberry up here, the Andy Griffith show. Um, a lot of people aren't watching. So I don't necessarily have the bureaucratic uh, hoops that other people in larger metropolitan areas have to jump through. Although, having grown up just outside the Chicago area and understanding you know, big politics and really having enjoyed watching daily back in the day around Chicago, small town politics and bureaucracy can be just as, as convoluted as metropolitan areas. But people are a little more concerned about being um, found out. And I think also that in a rural community, people really are 
they really are wanting a safe community. Many have chosen to live in a place like this because they believe their children would be safer. They believe there would be less substance abuse going on. They believe that the school systems would work better for their children. And so I have gifted the community and continue to with the opportunity to understand what collective responsibility means. Because I have four staff members and myself. And as I said to the county commissioners yesterday, you know, we really are doing this because we love this work. But the truth of the matter is, you all need to step up. And if you're not stepping up, you're asleep at the wheel. And we cannot change this on our own. So I think there are very huge similarities to metropolitan areas. I think, again, to stress the advantages, it's very personable. But again, growing up, you know, in a fairly uh, good-sized area, I think everywhere has the potential to be a small town. There's as much gossip in downtown Manhattan as there is in Port Angeles, Washington. So, Becca, what's um, surprised you most in working with incarcerated survivors, and what's inspired you most? <sighs> surprised me the most? Um, well, at 60 and having been around the block a few times, I don't surprise easily. But I think, I think if I had to pick the biggest surprise, it was that the way I approached what I think is a key piece of being successful in getting in to work with incarcerated individuals is the relationships. And I'm talking from literally from the county sheriff to the under sheriff who I have on speed dial, and he picks up the calls, to the jail nurse who is my direct conduit, to those who are working in the jails who when I first walked in, um, were a little cool, and I was on their turf, and I established very quickly that I knew I was on their turf, and that I appreciated their uh, taking care of my safety, and I appreciated them allowing me to help take some of the burden of these horrible um, outcomes of victimization off of their shoulders and let me help them carry that. And that was a surprise how easy that part was. Once I built the relationships, and I put it into the perspective of, this is yours. I am, I'm the interloper here. But I need you to integrate me into this facility. And here's why. And they did. And it's been absolutely lovely. So tell us a little bit about the services that you've been providing to survivors at the jail and how that's going. Uh, survivors in the jail are provided the exact same services that anyone walking into our agency will get except for emergency and transitional housing because their housing is taken care of. Um, we, and again, we're, st we're still working on this. I also go into the juvenile facility and that's a fairly regular place to visit because people are disclosing more and more and more. Um, we go in and it's the same, it's the same as with any other client. Thank you for trusting me enough to call for me, and what can I do? Tell me your story. And then it just unravels, as we all see with anyone else. There's very little difference except the environment. So and how many, um, th this is a fairly small jail, about 125 beds, something like that. Correct. How many calls are you getting? Um, I would say we're averaging about once a month right now. Uh, since they have implemented PREA standards and uh, put the, uh, the, the line, the, line, the telephone line, so that people are available to call our crisis line, we saw a bit of an increase, and we saw a bit of an increase with, uh, with males stepping forward. And so far, every uh, survivor that we have gone in to see uh, absolutely none of those have been uh, crimes committed within our facility. Mm -hmm. And I know there's a nearby as well. So, and, and I forgot about the juvenile facility. About how often are you going into the juvenile facility? The juvenile facility, we're in probably two times a week on the average. Mm -hmm. And what, how, what's the size of that facility? Uh, that one I think can accommodate 60 children. Okay. And I know there's a, a really large prison also um, relatively near you. Um, who services that 
facility? There is another uh, dual agency called Forks Abuse Program that is located in Forks, Washington, which is in the very northern, uh, northwestern corner of, of the peninsula. And uh, the decision for who serves the prisons is based on geography, and they are geographically closer to Clallam Bay Prison, so they mm -hmm. serve it. And do you know about how often they're getting calls there? That, that's a fairly large facility, isn't it? Do you know how many inmates that one houses? No, I don't. Um, but I can pull that up real quickly while we're talking. Um, I, the last time I talked to Ann Simpson, who is the executive director there, was about a month ago to get the, uh, the update on what's happening for her with that. Um, and she said that I think they had been in there three or four times already. And they were very pleased with the relationship that was happening with, uh, with the, the prison staff there. And they were still, you know, it's, it's in the early stages still. Yes. Um, they are still working on building those relationships, which in that particular prison, which I've worked in before, or I've gone to before, is uh, obviously a very, very, um, it's, there's some risk in being mm -hmm. there, as there are in any facility. And so, Becca, um, just to, to um, go over the services you provide, again, you are, um, your hotline is available to the inmates and to the residents of the juvenile facility as well? No, uh, we have not really established that, although it's ha yes, the, the hotline is available to the jail inmates, and the, the protocol that we have worked out with the juvenile facility is that uh, the hotline is available to any of the guards there, and mm. so they are able then to, any of the detention folks, and they then will call if they need us on the crisis line. So far, that has been, um, that has not even happened. It has always been during the day that I've gone in. And by mm -hmm. the way, Clallam Bay uh, has a capacity of 858 male offenders. Okay. And um, so you, the hotline's available to inmates, and then you actually go into the facility as well to do one-on-one -on -one crisis counseling. Is yes, that correct? Yes, we do. And we have, we have a couple of locations where we can do it. And that was a very important piece. Thank you for making me think of that. It was very important to me where um, I was going to meet with, with survivors in the facility because I didn't, obviously, safety first. Um, and our particular jail is really kind of the only detox center we have in the entire county. Uh, we don't have a detox center in our hospital, and that's another disadvantage to being a very small rural community. So uh, it's not uncommon at all that people are, are incarcerated while they're high. So that was of great concern. The second was the privacy and the confidentiality. And um, I made very clear with the administrators that uh, I, I honored their rules and that I won't be telling them diddly unless I think someone is a danger to themselves or others. And they were totally accepting of that because, again, the trust had been built. And when I said it, and I have a reputation for, I'm so menopausal I don't remember much anyway, so you can tell me anything and I will not remember it, so I won't tell. And they offered me, um, you know, the suicide room, which, no thanks. And there is a small room that um, I've been using mostly. They offered me the visitation booth, but again, those conversations are recorded, and that's not appropriate. We also have access to the lawyer's booth, which is not recorded. So when I don't have an available room right in in the facility, well, it's all in the facility, but right where everyone's living, um, I can go to a lawyer's booth. But I would rather be sitting at a table, I would rather be able to be physically present, not have glass between us, and so far, uh, to go back to your question of surprise, is not so much a surprise, but absolutely pleasing to me, is that not one of the survivors that I or my staff have met with in the jail, uh, or in the juvenile facility have, not one of them has said, this was stupid, I never should have done this, uh, you guys are full of crap, whatever. It has always been with gratitude, and oftentimes we are able then to start a process of helping them plan for rapid rehousing when they get out, uh, cert lining up services prior to release, um, and these are very important things. As with any other survivor, the faster we can get them into the accessible, appropriate resources, irregardless of what others may think about them. 
that's our obligation, moral, philosophical, and business-wise. Well, thanks, Becca. Is there anything else that you want to share with the advocates across the country that um, has been helpful to you or you think would be helpful to them before we open it up for questions? Yes, I just want to reiterate one thing. And um, for those of you I've never met before, which is most of you, I really have no problem talking on and on and on. And I have learned um, through the guidance of particularly the, the cops and the, and the lawyers that I'm working with so closely, is to ask the question, shut up and listen, and you will get the answer. And the other was was establishing this multidisciplinary team um, for the Children's Advocacy Center, and I already had a seat on our county protocol. And so having built the relationship with everyone in the county protocol team, which included child protective services, law enforcement, education, medical, tribal, I had access already to all the key players I wanted. And then it was a matter of the selling, the selling point. And part of what we do is we, we pitch. We pitch because we're changing how we think. Cultural competency is, includes the culture of a jail, includes the culture of a prison, includes the culture of a school, includes the culture of a juvenile center. I think there's a culture that goes with in the logging community, and there's a culture that goes with the chess club. So apply your cultural competency and sensitivity issues into the culture of the jail and ask the questions, what do you need, and then be quiet and listen, and they will tell you. Thank you so <laughs> thank you so much, Becca. Well, what you've been doing there in in Port Angeles has certainly been working for survivors, um, and it's something we heard um, time and again when we talk to folks there. So, uh, thank you for the work you're doing, and thank you for being part of the webinar. And now I think we're going to move to some questions. So, if you can hang around, because I'm sure folks will have some questions for you. Um, I want to encourage everyone to submit any questions that you might have about what Becca just went over or what Linda discussed or anything else from the webinar, any other questions you have into the question box. And while we're gathering questions, I'd like to share a quote from a survivor. I had to repeat my story over and over. It was hard for me to keep going, but I began to draw strength from the other women who were in prison with me. They helped me realize that anyone can be sexually assaulted. Abuse doesn't play favorites as to education or color. Likewise, we all have the strength to survive it. The only way to stop sexual assault behind bars is by breaking the silence and speaking up. We can all draw strength from each other. You're not alone. And that was Robin from Colorado. Remember, too, that you're not alone in doing this work. There's a community of support out here for you advocates as well. And I hope that you take advantage of the advocacy resources that we have available. You can always contact us for particular questions you might have or for technical assistance um, and training. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Now I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, Carolina uh, Aparicio, and she's going to go over some of your questions. Thank you, Vivian. So we're getting a lot of really great questions. Um, so let's just dive right in. Um, so I think, Becca, I think it would be great if you could maybe um, start some, a lot of these. I think a lot of folks have questions specifically for you, and of course, um, Linda and Vivian, if you want to add anything. Um, so the first question, um, staff at my local detention facility denies any incidents of sexual assaults. They've told us that there's too much risk involved in allowing advocates to, in to visit with inmates. Where do we even begin? Do you want to start, Becca? Oh, I would love to start on that one. <laughs> I, I think that, oh, you are given a golden opportunity to educate these lovely, lovely folks. Um, don't even mess with the staff. Go straight to the top. Go to whoever the director of uh, your juvenile facility is and go in thoughtfully, prepared, and with what you can provide. Not what you need them to do, but what you can provide and why. I don't know if you have in your school, school resource officers. We have what's called an SRO here. And I, I have built a, an outstandingly close relationship with that particular officer. Because children at the high school, who many of them are ending up back in, in juvenile facility, uh, are disclosing to him because he's doing his job so well. This man has educated himself and has opened himself to that. 
the, the staff at the facility are afraid of their liability. If you go to the director and see if you can call a meeting with uh, the, ju the juvenile facility counselor or therapist on staff, because if you approach with, here's some of the burden I can take off of your shoulders, then I think you'll have more success. Great. Uh, Vivian or Linda, do you want to ask, add anything to that? I mean, I think that's, that's brilliant. I mean, that, that approach, of course, people always respond better to, you know, I, I would like to help you. How can I help you? Let's work together. And um, I mean, I think, you know, another sort of linchpin that you have right now, if you're willing and able to provide some services and offer some help, is that the, the Prison Rape Elimination Act standards require them to at least attempt to work with rape crisis programs. And so if you're offering to help and they're saying no, then clearly they're not, they're not meeting that particular standard. And of course you need to be careful about how you present that. You could say, look, I've learned about these PREA standards. We know you have to be um, in compliance with them. We know that survivors services, victim services are a part of that. How can we help you? You know, we'd like to help you with that. Um, here's, as Becca said, here's what we can do. Here's what we provide um, in the community. And and I think again, this may feel less true for prisons, but certainly for juvenile facilities and for county jails, for community confinement or work release facilities. The people are a part of the community all the time anyway. Most people's average jail stays um, in a lot of small rural jails is is a is hours to a couple of days. So people are in and out. It's not as if these are locked away people that are not part of the community every single day. So it, it behooves the entire community to make sure that people don't leave a jail or a youth facility more traumatized than they went in. And I think that as a community, that's something to really recognize. And I think we talk about incarcerated survivors, and we tend to think of, oh, this is this entirely separate population. It's, it's not part of the whole picture. And, and I think particularly in rural areas, it's just that's simply not true. This is Becca. Am I muted? Nope, no, you're here. unmuted. Thank you so much. I'd like to just <laughs> add something else there, too. Thank you for that, Linda. Um, I would really encourage all of you to make sure that you talk to your boards about this too. And mm -hmm. I can already hear some of you snickering because we all know the issues that we have with uh, boards and our little nonprofits. I that was what I made a priority when I first came on here. Is I needed to build a healthy board because I come from the private sector. Mm -hmm. I was a private businesswoman. I'm a really rotten social worker. So I needed I needed counseling. I needed guidance. And I started recruiting very strong people you will find that they will add credibility to you, especially if you take one of them along to some of these meetings. And you will also build a very strong relationship with your board. I, am, I make my board nervous sometimes, but I always make sure I tell them first before I'm jumping on the Titanic. Um, and the other thing I'd like to encourage a lot of you to think about is that you're running businesses or you're working in a business. And we, culturally in this country, have been taught that you know uh, social service agencies, service providers, um, should be you know hitting themselves on the back with a whip and bleeding and making little money and have no benefits and absolutely no retirement and and let's certainly what more can we do for you and still not get paid attitude and when I came in with a business attitude although it was a little scary at first for a lot of people um, and I just stayed consistent on um, I have a fiscal responsibility to be a good steward of the money that I'm put in charge of. And the other thing is I have a responsibility to this community that I am, that I have promised to serve. And according to my mission statement, it says women, children, and men. It doesn't say women and children only. It doesn't say only those making over 50 grand a year, only white folks, only native. It says women, children, and men. And that is the mission statement by which I default to every time there's an issue. That's another thing that you can present to the potential partners that you're, that you're nurturing relationships with. Fantastic. Um, so we have another question, Becca. Of course, we would love you to uh, take it, uh, give the first answer. Um, 
Someone asked, I wonder if they have any, have had, if you have had any struggle serving incarcerated survivors who are also perpetrators of other clients. I would think this would be a higher likelihood in rural communities. Have you had to deal with that? The answer to that is a definitive yes. And I have also been um, publicly, uh, well, I've just been screamed at by a few community members in a public forum. Uh, how dare you serve someone? who is a perpetrator. And my response, again, is very clearly, I, it's just like we are, you know, believe first. That's exactly what our job is, to believe first. I think it's horrible that that person perpetrated. I think it's horrible that person was perpetrated on. I am there to address the victim slash survivor that I am addressing at that moment. And you know that their perpetrating has played a part, because that's part of the fabric of who they are. But again, I'm, I'm a real simple gal. I look at what's in front of me. I try and look at the landscape. And when I meet, when I meet with, with a client, I want to go in as a dry whiteboard that's completely clean. Let them start writing on it, not me. And what I have found the majority of the time, and I have worked with multiple victim perpetrators, um, is that there's a great deal of baggage, a great deal of baggage. And we all know this. So I focus on what my job is, what I'm there for. I'm not law enforcement. I'm not the judge. I'm not the jailer. I'm there because someone who has been hurt has called for help. I don't want to echo just some of that in the Kern County project, both with the prison and with the local jail, they had worked out, you know, a plan of, and this is true with, with any survivor, right, with any client, that if you're providing services beyond crisis, so I think kind of the crisis services, the hotline call, the first hotline call, hospital accompaniment, this question doesn't really come up so much there. You're not gathering background information. You're certainly not doing background checks on everyone. So anyone you see at the hospital or who calls the hotline could have done something horrible in the past, and you just don't know it. Um, and so we, we didn't really need to address it so much for crisis services, but for longer-term counseling, we certainly did. And, and just like they would with any client, they were really careful to set out the boundaries and limits of what the services they provide. So for example, they're not providing sexual sex offender treatment. They're not going into you know, except how it may be related to their, their current situation, the dynamics of, of what they did. They're not there to do restorative justice, right? So they were setting up, this is what we can provide, this is what we can do, and being really clear um, with people that if they need sex offender treatment, they need to be referred to someone who's trained in that, because this particular agency didn't have anyone trained in that. So if that makes sense. And, and again, I think looking, there are some definitely different dynamics with this population, but I think, I mean, Becca, I don't know if you would echo this, but something we've seen is that the similarities to once you get going, once you get your kind of, your stride here, the similarities with the other populations of survivors you work with much outweigh the differences. I would, I would concur with that, Linda. Uh, I would also just add to that that I have been, um, I have been, well, maybe I'll go back to that surprise word, a little surprised. <laughs> Having never been incarcerated, knock on wood, um, I was a little bit surprised again to find how similar everybody is. Mm -hmm. This is the same thing that, and I'm not popular in some circles for saying it, I, I mean that whole cultural competency, cultural sensitivity thing, it's very important and a lot of people need to figure it out. I, I personally try very hard to approach any demographic, of any, any kind, oops, sorry, I think I've messed something up there, any demographic with what are our similarities? Mm -hmm. How are we the same? And I think that the best advantage I had to that, because that's not really a common approach. You know, I, I was invited to do a, a sexual assault training for the Lower Elwha Tribal uh, Social Services Department. I was extremely honored to do that and found myself in the company of um, some of the elder women. And we just started talking as grandmas to each other. And the, much of the conversation had, ta had 
focused on what the differences were. And there are many differences. And this is an underserved population here, no, no question about it. Um, by the same token, let's start rejoicing and celebrating the similarities because we do need each other. And it added a whole new dimension to this training that because of that, two of the law enforcement officers from the tribal law enforcement who were there decided they wanted to become engaged in the Children's Advocacy Center and start bringing the native children here. So it, it just snowballs, as mm. all of you know, because you've been doing the work. Yeah. Yeah, great. Um, so we're getting a few questions um, from folks who are saying, okay, we're ready to start. What's, what's the best way? How do we get our foot in the door? Um, what would you say to that? <laughs> I, I mean, I can start with that and, and then Becca or Vivian if you want to jump in. But I, I mean, I think first off, the, the answer, which is the, off, the worst answer in the world, is, is it depends, right? I mean, sort of some of it depends on your circumstances. So look at, look at the landscape, do kind of an assessment of what do, you, what do you have to get your foot in the door. Are you talking about working with a jail that's operated out of the sheriff's department? If you're doing that, and you have some kind of sexual assault response team in the community or a coordinating council that looks at these issues or a project like Becca mentioned of you know, the Child Advocacy Center getting that going, you already have good contacts um, within the department to make a step. So again, Kern County going back to that, the Rape Crisis Center that we worked with, Women's Center High Desert, already had a good relationship with the with the, sh the sheriff because of their work in the community. So we, we kind of started with those relationships. So that, that depends. Um, if it is kind of a cold call, it's a prison or it's a youth facility that you haven't been, um, been involved with at all, they may have a position at their facility now called a PREA coordinator, Prison Rape Elimination Act coordinator, if they've started to work on the Prison Rape Elimination Act, and that might be a person to start um, to just to contact a community uh, public information officer or some whatever number you see um, either on their website or their materials around um, who who responds to the community to offer some assistance. If if they don't have a Prison Rape Elimination Act coordinator at all, oftentimes you can start with the, su the superintendent or the supervisor, the warden, whatever that person is. If you don't know how to reach out to them either, then um, medical or mental health departments can often be really good allies. I think, Becky, you had mentioned to me one time before that, that the nurse at the jail ended up being a really strong partner and so medical or mental health can be. But I guess in terms of getting your foot in the door, it really takes sort of assessing the landscape where you already have connections and as Becca mentioned earlier, approaching people you already have connect connections with is great if you can do that and offering to help. Look, I know you have to do this. I know this is something that's part of your work now. I'd like to work together. We, we can help. And um, we hear often from corrections agencies that are scrambling to try to get services in place, that are reaching out and not hearing back from someone. And so you may find that once you reach out to that connection, they're sitting there thinking the same thing. How, how, do, we, how do we make this connection? How do we get our foot? How do we get their foot in the door? <laughs> um, and, and I've definitely heard that as well. Yeah, Linda, absolutely. And I think, too, um, look at if, if you don't have direct connections, leveraging some of your other connections that might, mm -hmm. who on your board might have connections, um, and, and just um, use those as entree. Also, um, check with your state coalitions mm -hmm. to see what work they're doing. Um, most of them now are looking at uh, how do they help their members with capacity building and you could see what maybe some groundwork that they've done if they're working with a larger Department of Corrections in the state. Okay, this is Becca, may I jump in? Yes, please. Okay, I've been just frantically writing. Um, <laughs> the, the question, as I recall, was how do you get your foot in the door? Yeah. Um, my question back, if you, whoever asked that, could real quickly tell me, are we talking uh, 
county jail level or are we talking uh, prison facility level? And while you get me that answer, uh, the first thing you do is you get smart. Don't go in with this mamby-pamby social worky attitude that you're here to do good and, and here's what you have to offer. And pardon me if that sounds harsh. Um, assess your own programs from within. Know them in and out. So get smart. Know who your players are because in some communities, and look, you know who you are, this is going to be a big political game. It's going to be a power play. And it's not. It's not a power play. And once you diffuse that fear, because basically the pushback you're going to get is out of fear. They're going to lose power. They're going to lose control. They're going to be told what to do because they're already being told what to do by the government. Okay? Then plan your strategy. And this sounds very complicated, but it's not. Make sure you know what the heck you're doing. Make sure you know and understand who you're dealing with. And then plan. What is it that we want to accomplish? Well, that part of that question can be answered by asking them, what is it you guys need to accomplish? We understand that, that now there are pre-regulations that you, you are, I don't know, and you can go ahead and play stupid. I, do you have to comply with them? You know, this kind of stuff. Um, and then ask them, what can we do to help you accomplish that? When you get the answer to that, and this is a default that a lot of particularly directors make because they get excited, you don't have to reinvent your wheel or your agency around this. Mm -hmm. When you as agencies figure out you have trained quality staff, so look inside first because you don't want to send a staff member in there who is going to wet their pants or cry because it got a little scary or it smells funny. Um, so you want to make sure you've got a solid staff going in. And I was the only one who went in until finally I said to two of my staff members, I have got to let you go. I, I, I have to force myself to do that, and they've been brilliant. So don't reinvent your agency because of the build on your successful programs. There may be things you are asked to do that you have to say no to. Mm -hmm. That is perfectly, perfectly all right. Do not please, please. No, how am I supposed to say? I'm not supposed to be bossy as an advocate. I would encourage you to not be apologetic for who you are and what you do. I was publicly called a professional handholder by an idiot lawyer in, in the courtroom one day. And I welcomed him to, um, I gave him my card after he did that and invited him to send any clients who he needed a professional handholder for to call me. You, you can take any of the barriers and turn them into gifts to your community, your service providers, law enforcement, jail, jail uh, staff, and to your clients, and you can turn them around. Um, and I cannot stress enough, make sure that you are going in there prepared and smart and that you are taking advocates who are prepared, smart, and well-trained. The end. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, that person who asked the question said that there's all those types of facilities in her in her area. Okay, then I would suggest when you, um, I think it was Vivian who said, or maybe Linda, the warden and mental health in the in the state facility. Mm -hmm. The warden mental health, that's great. Um, you probably won't get to the warden, but definitely try. Always go to the top first. Always go to the top first. I'm in a position now, and I don't know why, but our county sheriff will see me in the courthouse, he saw me at the radio station the other day, and hugs me. Now, hello? I don't know many people who are getting hugs from their county sheriffs unless they're married to them. So, and I'm not sleeping with the guy, so don't, that's not what's happening. But I would say, in the state facility, start with your, um, and they're not called events coordinators, excuse me for that, but they're the ones who put together the support programs for mm -hmm. inmates. That's going to be your best ally because that person will love having the burden taken off them. When you approach this with, here's the service I'm highly trained for, I'm skilled, I am the expert in my community, you're not. Here's what I can bring to you. What do you want? Yeah. That's going to open the doors. Yeah, and then someone else here, um, one of our participants, just said that we offered bringing in training and bringing in training at no cost. That's mandatory that they have to, under the PREA standards. Um, budgets are tight, so to help me get my foot into the door. It's one solution. Mm -hmm. so. 
So yeah. The phone skipped, this is back. The phone skipped out. Was it that you were offering to do trainings at no charge? No. Mm -hmm. This this one participant said that they offered. They went to their local facility and offered to give training at no cost, um, which was mandatory under the Prius standards for them. And um, like understanding that the budgets are tight, and that really helped that person get their foot in the door at the facility. Well, whoever you are, I think you're brilliant because that is a very good idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. definitely. Um, so our next question, um, someone, someone asked, um, a challenge we've faced is our unwillingness to sign an MOU with the detention centers that included a lack of confidentiality between survivor and advocate due to the detention center's guidelines. Any advice? Sorry, the phone, the phone cut out again. Could you repeat that, please? Sure. Um, a challenge we've faced is our unwillingness to sign an MOU with the detention centers that included a lack of confidentiality between survivor and advocate due to the detention center's guidelines. Any advice? Oh, is, did you want Becca yeah. to answer that? Yeah, go for it. Oh, I love challenges like that because um, what you can do is you can simply take that MOU and get out your red pen and make the changes you want. Because what you want to do is, just like you are expert with empowering your clients, you need to empower these very insecure, frightened government employees. Um, you go back with your red pen and with a copy of, pull the pages out of your domestic violence and or sexual assault contract to talk about confidentiality with your law that protects your confidentiality. They cannot demand something that state law has already uh, said you have the right, you are protected, okay? You are protected legally. So make sure, that, again, this is a matter of educating. Know your players. Mm -hmm. Educate them. I would be more than happy to accommodate you, but I can't. I'm bound by contract and by law. But here's what I can do. If we can reword this, that I will not disclose to you except when, of course, it's going to be if that, if that uh, inmate is a, a, a danger to themselves or others. Yeah. Take I the think, document. Yeah. Do not send them back a rewritten document. Just redline it a little bit. Yeah, I think that's, and, and as you said, Becca, too, this is a real opportunity for kind of education and relationship building. I mean, I think in a lot of the, the places that we've um, done some projects. This has been something you know. It take it took that it took several conversations for them to sort of understand, and and also the other thing it it often takes is providing the space for the corrections department or agency to explain their perspective, why this feels so frightening to them, why this feels so important to them, why they see it the way they see it. Because I think with confidentiality, a lot of times. Really, we're speaking different languages, advocates and corrections officials, when we talk about it. In, in some, and again, th this didn't happen when we worked with um, with Becca specifically in the jail because it seemed like the PREA coordinator there got it right away, why that was important. Um, and that will happen sometimes, <laughs> um, but I, I've, I've worked with some other places where it's it's been quite a long discussion. And, and part of what's gotten it to, as Becca said, is pulling out the state statute, this is accepted practice, this is actually, you don't have a choice that understanding that that advocate's perspective generally is I keep confidentiality unless I have a reason that I can prove that I have no choice but to break it, right? Whereas the corrections folks are looking at, I never, I report everything unless I have a reason to prove that I can prove that I have no choice but to keep it confidential. So you're really looking at coming at it from totally different directions. And I think sometimes taking the time to explain that um, can get you there. The other thing, again, I'm going to bring back for, from the perspective of the corrections folks to pull back to the PREA standards. The PREA standards do say that they should, that they must allow contact with the service provider that is and it says as confidential as possible, right? And so clearly the Department of Justice intended that confidential services should be possible, right? And if they're, they can't simply decide it's not possible because they think they want to know everything. And one more piece that is sometimes helpful is um, to explain that they're likely to get m more 
solid reports that can be investigated if that is, you know, if that is indeed what they say they want. That's the only reason they might say you can't have confidentiality is because they're afraid, right, that then they won't get those reports. But that survivors who have the support of an advocate are much more likely to report, much more likely to be able to stick with the investigation, and much less likely to recant. And we know that, right? All of you listening on this call who are advocates, you know that. The sexual assault response team model that's been around since the early 90s across the country has proven that again and again and again, right? And it's it's also been proven in um, in corrections as well. To quote an assistant warden of the first prison I ever did work in, and it was in California, it was a big men's prison, and we were talking about this and staff were flipping out about how can you possibly... and they looked at me and said, you would hear that someone's been raped and you wouldn't report it? How can you look at yourself in the mirror, right? That This is how our meeting started. And after listening for a while, the deputy warden said, well, we're not getting reports now. Why don't we try something different? We can't get less. Maybe this way we'll get more. And that is indeed what happened, that over a nine-month period when we were tracking reports, numbers of reports more than doubled once rape crisis services were available inside the prison. So that would be another thing to go back to. They're scared of that because they think they'll get less information, but their it, experience bears out that they'll actually get more. Yeah, absolutely, Linda. I, I agree with that. And also, it's just that they don't know what advocates do, mm -hmm. and making clear what it is that advocates do is really helpful. It's part of that education. It's letting them know why confidentiality is a benefit, as Linda said, and, and making clear that the roles are very different. You have different mandates, although they, they can complement each other very nicely. Um, they're very different mandates, and I think that goes a long way into, into having them understand why it's so important to have confidentiality and getting that in an MOU. Mm -hmm. That is exactly right, Vivian. This is Becca again. Um, I think that when, when you talk about, first of all, I just want to reiterate, for, for you who was given the MOU and you can't sign it at this point, you were given an opportunity to open negotiations. And that is, you're, you're just about there. I don't know where you are, but you're just about there. Um, you can start negotiating with that dialogue, and just be real careful about how you how you quote the PREA standards, but memorize them because it can become integral into your into your conversation. Look, we understand that you are bound by PREA to do X, Y, and Z, and we understand that that is something that is new and different. We are also on kind of unfamiliar turf, so together, let's start defining what each of us can maybe do for the other. Right now, I have a feeling I can do more for you. So here's what I have to offer you. And then be quiet and listen. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so we have a question about funding. Um, how do you generate funding for services? Where are the grants to comply with PREA? If only the jails are eligible to apply, how does a private nonprofit get in on that? Um, Linda, I don't know if you want to start on that one. Sure. Well, when you say that the grants to comply with PREA, I'm assuming you mean that there's there's been a pools of grants available through the Bureau of Justice Assistance, and um, corrections agencies, state and government agencies can apply for them to help them comply with the PREA standards. And so in, in many of these grants, there have been community partners. So this is, I think, where the relationship building, we're getting it started, um, is, is really important. I'm going to bring up the Kern County again. We had already built a relationship. They already had a relationship with the jail. So when JDI and the Rape Crisis Center, Women's Center High Desert approached Kern County Jail and said, look, there's these grants going to be available. Do, should we all apply together? They were ready because we'd already built that relationship. Um, that doesn't always, you know, that doesn't always work. You're not going to get probably that first off. But if you've done some groundwork, if you've done some, um, some relationship building, that is something they can apply for a grant and write you in as a subcontractor. They absolutely can do that. So that, that is a possibility. 
Other places that there have been funding um, that I've seen go, go through is rape crisis programs applying for community, local community foundations or other local grants under the auspices of calling it starting a new program. That's another thing that, that we've seen. For those of you who do receive OVW funding, the OVW funding um, can be used to serve incarcerated survivors. Becca mentioned earlier the service guidelines around Victims of Crime Act funding. Um, th that, that, that rule that, that for those funds cannot be used to serve incarcerated survivors is in the process of being changed and all indications are that um, before the summer that that will be changed. I'm, Again, I, I can't give you a date and I can't give you exactly how it's going to read, but I think probably many of you know that, that that was out in a public comment period last year and that's one of the rules that's going to be changed. So that, that is a positive change for this work on the horizon. Um, Linda, may I uh, jump in yeah. real quickly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, regarding that, that rule being changed by summer, interestingly enough, and I don't know if it's the same for you in other states, for those of you in other states, but our sexual assault funder this fiscal year, so starting July 1 of 14, allows us on our timesheets to put jail. So mm -hmm. as long as we document how many hours we're in a facility, we can bill that to our sexual assault funding now, which I find oh, very that's interesting. Great. Yeah. Well, it's not changed. Mm -hmm. And it's still not all that much money. But right. I wanted to just say very quickly too, um, I'm not scoring real well in the um, in my kind of sniffing around at potential um, grant funding uh, for going into jail. <laughs> it doesn't seem to be a real popular uh, funded yeah. program. It's, I, I'm finding now that people are, uh, they're more excited to talk to me about sexual assault victims who are children rather than to talk about sexual assault victims and survivors who are incarcerated. So that may backfire eventually, I don't know. Oh, that, that's a yeah that that is a good a good point as well that that I think a lot of places are providing some services and I think as you mentioned Beck it's not like you haven't worked really hard on that project you have but now that it's up and running you're getting a call a month you're going it it's it's sort of been something that sounds like has once it's gotten started and once you've seen the demand folded into your programs um, that said. This is something that is important to many facilities, and you know, again, that's going to vary. Some, but some facilities find it very, very important. Some don't, um, and so I, I think what's going to ha what is happening in many places is that facilities are contracting with service providers after time. Um, a lot of times, that's happening after they see the value of the service. Right, um, it, it often doesn't happen first. You have to build the relationship first. But it is definitely happening. I'm seeing it happen more and more. Um, I, I, we do have a note here. Thank you from that Megan. That I don't believe VOCA restricts services to incarcerated juveniles. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll look into that. I thought it was any incarcerated person, but you might absolutely be right about that. Um, but so that's definitely something to look look at. Um, I. I think we are about out of time for questions. I know we didn't get to every single question. Goodness, I do want to say you all were so engaged. You had so many fabulous questions. And we invite you a couple of things. If you haven't, if we did not get to your question, um, you can go to our website and um, ask for technical assistance. We'll give the link to that in just a moment. And we're happy to answer any questions um, offline through either our technical assistance page or through our advocate assistance page, which is advocate at justattention.org. Um, I know there was a question from a, a youth facility about having challenges with getting the full services that you were willing to offer in working with your local rape crisis program. I wanted to mention to you specifically, but to everybody in general, that the PREA Resource Center also offers technical assistance and training. So for example, if you're um, an agency that would really, that has done some talking, but you feel like you need some help, you need some additional training, in 
partnering with your corrections facility and you and they want to work together, you can go to the PREA Resource Center Technical Assistance Request page as well. Their website is prearesourcecenter.org. If you just Google PREA Resource Center Technical Assistance, it'll go to the page. And um, we are, JDI is one of the technical assistance providers for the PREA Resource Center, as is the Moss Group, which some of you may have heard of. So depending on what you ask, you would get um, one or the other of us, so that's definitely a possibility. Uh, a couple folks had asked if, you're, if uh, Becca was willing to give out her email, and um, she so incredibly generously is, with the caveat that she might not get back to people. Uh, very quickly, as you heard, she's really, really busy and <laughs> takes on a lot of work, but um, her email is healfam, H-E-A-L-F-A-M-2, at olipen.com, so that's H-E-L-F-A-M-2 at O-L-Y-P-E-N.com. Um, and Becca also, wel Becca, Becca also welcomes phone calls <laughs> at Healthy Families, so and that's 360-452-3811. Thank you, Becca. You're very, very generous. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. Just wanted to mention quickly Hope Behind Bars. It's, we have an advocate's guide to helping survivors of sexual abuse, and it's free. It can be found on our advocate resource um, page of the website. We also um, want to give you the link to the advocate um, page so you can ask for you can ask questions or ask for technical assistance, and that is um, on the next slide. At um, advocate, wait, there we go, <laughs> advocate um, at justdetention.org, and you can see there where you can ask questions or um, ask for technical assistance so we can help you with any particular issue you're dealing with in relationships with facilities or whatever you might need. Um, also, we have a resource guide for survivors, and that lists legal and psychological counseling resources by state for survivors who are still incarcerated, um, those who have been released, and loved ones on the outside who are searching for ways to help. So if your agency is interested in being listed as a resource, please fill out the form found on the link on your screen, and we'll also include the link in our follow-up email, which you'll receive later. So thank you so much, all of you, for joining us. Please take a moment to complete the evaluation and provide us with feedback. And the link to the email is on the slide here. You'll also receive it in the email. Um, for more information, just visit our page. You can also contact us um, at advocate at justdetention.org, and we invite you to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Thanks again, everyone, and have a great day.